When you think of life in other worlds, what do we immediately start to imagine? Something like this, right? Little green men, a tall, super intelligent species that comes in a spaceship ready to invade Earth. Well, have you ever wondered what we really know about life in the universe? People have looked at the skies and wonder about the possibility of life in other worlds for centuries. But it was only in the 50s, in the 1950s space age, uh, where a molecular biologist named Joshua Lederberg that first introduced the term exobiology to define the study of the biological impact of the space missions and to define the study of the search for the extraterrestrial life. So back then, space was a very hot topic, right? And Lederberg took that chance and teamed up, teamed up with Carl Sagan also. And together, they brought exobiology to the public and to the scientific communi community. And the field began to gain recognition. So space exploration developed, technology evolved, and so did the search and the science of the search of the extraterrestrial life. And it developed until what we know today as astrobiology. So astrobiology is the science that studies the origin distribution and evolution of life uh, in the universe. And it takes several branches of science, biology, geology, astronomy, physics, chemistry, but also engineering and sociology. And together we all come together as scientists and study life, but in a cosmic perspective. So how do we do it? Well, if we want to speculate about life, on other worlds, what it could be. The only logical starting point is to start by looking at our own planet, right? Because for now, the only planet that has life is Earth. So what we do is something called the Great Analogy. And in here, we use all the knowledge that we have from life on Earth, how it originated, how it evolved, what it looks like now, in which environments it lives in, and we extrapolate this knowledge to other environments in the universe, to extraterrestrial environments, to what other places of our solar system, and beyond. So the origin of life on Earth is one of the key main happenings for astrobiology. Because if we understand how life began here on Earth, then we know what it takes for life to have emerged in other places, right? So on Earth, life is thought to have emerged around 3.8 billion years ago. And back then, Earth was not the same as today. There was no oxygen, the ozone layer wasn't there, so we had a lot of radiation. And so the first forms of life would have to be anaerobic, so they would have to be able to grow up without oxygen, and they would have to find a way to protect themselves from, fr themselves from the radiation. This means that one of the possibilities is that life was uh, first originated in the deep oceans where the radiation wouldn't hit. So, okay, what it takes for life to emerge. At least, as we know now, two things, liquid water and organic molecules. So on early Earth, what we think is that the oceans would bring the molecules around, the tides would bring the molecules around, and eventually the right molecules met at the right time, at the right place, and life emerged. The planet Earth evolved, there are many different life forms now, right? And biodiversity really is pushing forward because every day we find new organisms that live in places that we thought no life could ever exist. They are so extreme. These guys are called the extremophiles. These are just some examples of microorganisms that live from temperatures from minus 20 degrees to above 100. They live in very acid rivers or very salty lakes. And these extremophiles are essential for astrobiology because they help us set the limits of life. We hel they help us understand in which environments life can actually exist. One of the most extreme environments is actually space. So here on Earth, we have the ozone layer, as I said, the magnetic field that keeps us protected. But once you go up and you leave the ozone layer and you leave the magnetic field, you get hit by the space radiation, solar cosmic radiation. You get hit by the space vacuum. You get hit, not hit, but you are in microgravity. You would have no gravity. And astronauts that are in the International Space Station, they know this very well. Temperatures are very difficult to control as well. So one of the things that we want to know is, can life survive in space? We have been doing a lot of experiments 
Uh, many of them are simulations, so we have ground-based facilities that simulate the space radiation, the space vacuum. But we have also done a lot of, a lot of experiments in situ, so we have um, sent bacteria and other microorganisms to space. We have put them on the outside of the International Space Station, where they are exposed to the real space vacuum and the real space radiation. So they stood there for months, and what we found out is that many of them actually survive. So this raises the question, if life survives to the extremes of space, where else can it be? What other environments can be habitable? So the first place we actually look, of course, is our own solar system. Uh, we begin by looking at the moon. We went there. There is not. Doesn't, it seems that there is no life there. Uh, but then we focus on other things. Now our favorite second, our second favorite planet is Mars. But also other moons of Jupiter or Saturn are beginning to, to raise interest. But what really gives astrobiology an interesting twist was the discovery of the first exoplanet. Exoplanets are planets that are outside of our solar system, in other planetary systems. The first one was only found in 1995. Before that, we had no confirmation that a planet existed outside of our solar system. So after that, with the use of mainly of the Kepler telescope, we discovered a lot more exoplanets. One of the first was actually named Kepler-16, and it became quite famous, but only because it was similar to the planet Tatooine of Star Wars. It had two suns. It looks familiar. Now, with all of these exoplanets, we can know what other environments are there. We can check for habitable conditions. But there is one, it's one of my favorites, that is right here in our solar system. That is the Jupiter's moon Europa. Europa is very interesting, but mainly because it has a big ocean. This ocean has about 100 kilometers long, it's like three times bigger than Earth, and it, it's covered by an ice crust. Similar to what happens on Earth, we have an ocean and a crust, and the crust of Europa is made of ice. This ocean, so on Earth, our tides are created by the gravitational pull of the Moon, right? On Europa, and you can see there, the tides are created by the gravitational pull of Jupiter. Giant, giant Jupiter. So you can imagine that the tides are very, very fast, very dynamic, and they move the, the crust around, they, it clashes almost in a catastrophic way. And this, if you look at the scenario, what we have here, liquid water, right? So it's starting to look good. Maybe some organic molecules are already there. And we already have the movement of the tides that can bring the right molecules together at the right time, maybe in the right conditions. And although this, the, this ocean is known to be very cold and very salty, we already know some microorganisms that live in similar conditions, such as this guy. So who knows, maybe Europe already has an extremophile waiting to be found. There, is many there are many missions planned, um, also with the European Space Agency is planning some. One of them is the Jupiter Icy, Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE that is going to fly by Jupiter and its moons, and hopefully we'll find something more about it. And there is also ExoMars, that is one of the first European missions that is dedicated to astrobiology and will look for signs of life on Mars. But next time that you think of life in other worlds, maybe you will start thinking of these guys instead. Thank you. <laughs>